Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm assuming everyone can hear me all right. That this is not, you're not deaf, thank you. Um, that I'm not deafening you is what I mean. Um, when I first got my PhD, my mother was very, very excited and she called all of her friends and she said, my daughter's a doctor, but not the kind that can help you. <laughs> I said, well, no, mom, see, I do this research and I travel the country and she's still not convinced. So let me know at the end how I did. I can call my mom and tell her maybe I helped someone today, who knows. Um, so today what we're going to be uh, talking about, or I'm going to be talking about, is essentially the social science research and also memory. So this might bring back um, some, some kind of brief memories maybe of introduction to psychology if you've taken that sometime mm -hmm. in the past. Um, so here are my lofty goals uh, for our time together uh, today. First, I'm going to talk about what the value of eyewitness evidence is. And then finally, can eyewitness errors be prevented? Uh, now, I know there are a lot of law enforcement in the room. If your you know, phone goes off and you need to run out for an emergency and you can't stay for the whole time, um, I do want you to know that the answer to the second question is, uh, in some cases, we cannot eliminate all eyewitness identification errors. There's no technique uh, that has been developed where the error rate is zero. But we can significantly reduce these kinds of mistakes through um, some simple modifications. Um, but what we're going to, I know you've heard this just a couple of times, but you know, repetition is great for memory. Um, so I just want to say that there are 305 DNA exoneration cases in the United States um, right now. And of those DNA exoneration cases, eyewitness misidentification is the leading or most uh, com common um, contributing factor. And to plug, um, once again, uh, Professor Garrett's book, who looked at the first 250 DNA exoneration cases, what we know from that is, um, you know, almost 75 percent, the statistic you hear over and over are eyewitness cases. But what's really fascinating to me and maybe you are those cases in which more than one eyewitness made a mistake and identified an innocent person. So you might think that doesn't happen very often, but in the eyewitness DNA exoneration cases, so cases where there are eyewitnesses, it's a third of the cases. Some cases had five eyewitnesses who all made a mistake and identified an innocent person. So we look back and say, what happened essentially in those cases? And if you want to know the answer to that, you can buy the book because he tells you exactly uh, what happened um, in all of those cases. Um, so I want to talk about eyewitness evidence, perhaps in a way that you've not thought about it uh, before and so probably certainly not read about it in this way. And that is to think of eyewitness evidence as trace evidence. And so the eyewitness who sees a crime or hears something essentially has the evidence up here. And law enforcement's goal really is to collect the evidence that the eyewitness has up here. Well, how do you collect it? You can't swab it, you can't take a picture of it, you can't lift it. So instead, you develop questions and techniques in order to be able to get at the evidence. So as I go through talking about eyewitness evidence, I'm also going to talk about contamination of memory and contamination of the evidence. And so to think about the trace evidence analogy in that way, just like you would think of contamination in a crime scene um, when first responders come in and walk all over the crime scene. So memory is a form of trace evidence. Keep that in mind. And ultimately, what's really important is that you can't physically collect a witness's memory. So, the other thing that to keep in mind as uh, we kind of go through this is that it's a little bit more complicated than your typical forms of trace evidence. Um, each time you go in and you ask the witness more questions, you have a follow-up. You are potentially, as law enforcement, contaminating the memory or leaving traces. So you've spoken to multiple witnesses and you learn some information about the getaway car. Is it possible that some of your questions to other witnesses include in, or includes information about the getaway car? that that witness never told you about. So now all of a sudden, in going in and asking more questions, it's possible now th that you are leaving traces um, and contamination. Time is also not on your side because memories are uh, essentially degrading and changing as time passes. So getting information from witnesses as quickly as possible is also very, very important. So you might think that I'm going to stand up here and say, so eyewitness evidence cannot be reliable and it can't be trusted, and that is not my opinion. I think eyewitness evidence can be extremely reliable, but there are conditions that need to be met in order for that evidence to be reliable, like on any other type of evidence. First, the eyewitness evidence has to be strong to begin with. 
So the eyewitness who sees someone with a mask at night, you know, 30 seconds uh, or less encounter with a weapon, the witness is drunk, they just got out of the bar, is probably not going to have the strongest evidence. But the individual who was robbed by their next door neighbor, Frank, is probably going to have a pretty good memory, very strong evidence of what the individual looks like. So the strength of the evidence, the question you ask yourself, what are the chances that the eyewitness can have a very strong memory of what this person looks like before you even begin questioning the witness? So hopefully a lot of the things I'll talk about today will help you in your analysis to think, what are the chances that this witness could get it right given the certain circumstances? And it also has to be preserved. The evidence has to be preserved and it has to be collected properly. Those things are met, eyewitness evidence can be extremely valuable. So the role of the eyewitness, we're going to go through memory, kind of a 101. I've got some interactive things. I'm going to ask you questions. You're going to participate. Uh -huh. um, so it's not just me standing up here essentially for the next hour or so. So the eyewitness essentially goes through multiple steps, if you will, in, uh, when they are witness to a crime. First, they have to perceive something. They have to see or, or hear something. Next, they have to store the information, and they have to hold on to it. They have to be able to remember or recall that information when you ask them. And then finally, they have to be able to communicate that information. So children, as witnesses, for example, might be fine in the first few steps, but when they go to communicate information to you, it might be much more difficult. So we, I'm literally going to start at perception and how perception can ultimately influence what the eyewitness remembers and if it's what they remember, it's clearly going to influence what they report uh, to law enforcement. So kind of a textbook definition of what perception is, essentially that expe our expectations and experiences can influence what we perceive, how it is that your brain is going to interpret what's going on in your environment. So I'm just going to um, show you a couple of images here. I'm gonna, then I'm going to ask you what it is that you see. All right, what is this? First thing that comes to mind, it's real, it's okay, real quick. All right, so it's a man's face, okay, right? All kind of scrunched up. All right, keep watching. Okay, what do you see now? You see a naked woman, it's okay. You can, you can say that, all right, you're amongst friends. Now the interesting thing, of course, is that those two images where I asked you, what did you see, were actually the exact same image. But something that happened to you just moments before, I show you a man's face, you more likely, your brain is more likely to interpret that in the environment as being a man's face. I show you the naked woman, you're more likely to interpret that same ambiguous image as being a naked woman. So just keep in mind that things that just happened to you can certainly influence the way in which you interpret your environment. When I ask people to take a look at this slide and describe the gentleman in the middle, um, they usually say, you know, African-American male, uh, 35, bald, um, no scars or, you know, kind of distinguishing features. Um, he's medium skinned. And then when I change, essentially, the view, he is now described as being dark skinned. Because now in relation to the other people around him, he appears darker. So is it possible that the eyewitness who sees an individual with other individuals who are lighter or darker skin might report the individual as being different than what they really actually are? So clearly, perception is going to influence the memory and it certainly will influence the witness's report. So the big question uh, really is how does memory work? And we don't really exactly know how memory works. If we did, I would be very wealthy. Um, I'd work with a pharmaceutical company, we'd develop a pill or something, right? Um, so we don't know exactly how memory works. We know um, a lot about how memory doesn't work. It doesn't work like a video camera. If you ever heard a witness testify in the stand who says, I close my eyes and play it back, it's like it happened yesterday, right? Those kinds of statements actually are not borne out in reality. Um, this is not how memory works. Instead, it, memories are reconstructed. Um, so each time you think of something, you're essentially kind of reconstructing or rebuilding the memory. So if I were to ask you to think about a very important day in your life, uh, birth of a child, a wedding, maybe graduation, and if you think of that moment and you can see yourself in that event, it's not a real memory from that day. 
Right? So I see me, I'm, I'm still happily married. Maybe my story will change in the future, I don't know. Um, but I see me as my happy memory as my dad and me were dancing um, at my reception, wedding reception. And we have these big smiles on our faces. But I didn't have an out-of-body experience at the reception. And so my memory now, my big happy memory of my wedding is completely false. But it actually looks pretty similar to that photo I have on my desk. So I've contaminated my memory over time with my wedding photos. Now it's a good memory, it's a happy contamination, and no one's going to jail over it, so it's not really a big deal. But eyewitnesses who are brought back to the scene of a crime, who now see the event from a different perspective than they actually experienced it at the time. Witnesses who are actually shown video surveillance. I worked on a case where a witness was shown the video surveillance of the crime in order to, quote, jog her memory, and was immediately shown a photo array. <sighs> okay, so these kinds of things clearly cont contaminate the witness's memory. And when the witness has the opportunity to see things from a different perspective than from the original event, it's extremely problematic. So the stages of memory, generally speaking, this is very, very similar to the first, except I took off um, uh, perceive or perception at the very beginning. The stages of memory that we're going to talk about next are very, very important for you to understand and evaluate essentially what could have happened in an eyewitness's report of what it is that's happened, especially if that report alters or changes over time. So the first step is the encoding or acquisition. This is essentially the information, if you will, coming in. Then the storage, that period of time between when the crime occurred and when um, law enforcement starts to ask questions, at, which is the retrieval um, component of memory. So what I'm going to have you do is um, take a look at this slide. Hopefully everyone can see um, that the tables aren't blocking your view. And it's very simple. Uh, all I'd like you to do is tell me which one is uh, the real penny. Now, I don't want to hear any change jingling out there that will officially count as cheating, so I'd rather not have any of that. So just um, shout it out. Everyone's familiar with the penny? Am I? I never want to make this too difficult, but uh, there were a couple of brave people who yelled something out. Do you want to say it a little louder? And then I'm going to ask you some questions. So. Number five, why do you think number five? Oh, okay, um, for those of you who didn't hear, he said, well, she told me. We, we officially call that co-witness contamination, okay, of the memory, all right, okay. I say number five because I remember the date. The date's always on that side from when I was a kid. Okay. I do recall Liberty on that side, so. Okay, so you remember the date and Liberty, and so what about number one? Okay, it's missing something, right? Okay. I hate to tell you, there are a couple of people in the room who probably disagree with both of your answers. All right. Uh, anyone else? Seven. 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 Why number seven? Whoever wants to put themselves out there. The one cent. So there's something about the one cent, right? That you're like, oh, but there are people in the room right now going, but it's on the other side. But maybe they're questioning themselves, is it really on the other side? Now, I want to be very clear about something. If I were to make the test a little bit easier, let's say a show-up identification where one, wit one suspect is presented to the witness, the witness is asked, right, is this the person? So if I were to hold up a penny and say to you, what's this? It's a very easy test, right? And I hope that everyone here um, would, get, would get it you know, correct. They'd say that it was the penny. The problem with this is that you actually have to have a good memory of pennies in order to be able to get this right. So unless someone's a coin collector who studied pennies and, and, and other um, currency, this now becomes very challenging. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to th th throw at some hypotheses here and see, uh, I have some guesses of what it is that you did to come up with your response. So here's what I think a lot of people <coughs> did. They went uh, that whole top row and number six, something missing. I don't know what is. I, d I feel like there's just something. All you know what, 10, 11, and 12, facing in the opposite direction, what are the chances? That looks like a loaded question. Woo, those are out. So then you start to narrow things down. I don't know, some of them just feel weird. Nine, and God we trust on the side, that seems all packed in there. 
So what you're doing is you essentially eliminate the bad ones and narrow down your choices to the point where most people choose between five and seven, because those are the two that are the closest to your memory. And then the question for you is, is one of those close enough for you to say, yes, it's that one? This is what we refer to in the eyewitness research as relative judgment. And we're going to talk about the penny example when we talk about simultaneous identification procedures, or the six-pack, or the throwdown, um, whatever uh, terminology your department uses. But this also shows something else very, very important in terms of eyewitness procedure, and that is the instructions that are given to witnesses before the procedure. Because I didn't say to you, if the real penny is here, which one is it? I led you to believe that the correct answer is here, and your expectations were that I was going to show you something that had the right answer in it. But in fact, the real penny is not here. You can talk to me later, I'll send you the slide, you can pull out the penny, you can compare, I swear it's really not here. Okay. I've had people go, yes it is, and then go, oh no, it's not, you know, when they're looking directly. So this demonstrates a couple things. One, the relative judgment. When, you're, when the correct answer doesn't immediately pop out to you, you start going through another process, a deliberative, deliberative process to come up with your answer. And that is very different than recognition. It's very different than when you recognized what the correct answer was. Um, so again, we'll come back and talk about this um, when we talk about lineups. So just very, very quickly, I also want to talk briefly about how face memory works because I'm going to talk, um, uh, have a couple of slides on composites or sketches. And so I want to um, kind of preempt that discussion. So face memory actually works in a little bit different way than other types of memory if you're studying um, you know, for an exam or a test. Um, and I'll give you an example. Who was that? Julia Roberts. OK. Now, besides being upside down, the photo, um, was there anything else unusual about her face? Besides being upside down, was there anything unusual about her face? Okay. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to show it the other way um, so you can see what I showed you. I don't know why this continues to go. All right. This is the image that I actually showed you. Now, you know that her mouth and eyes are both upside down. But even when you know it, it's still difficult. I don't know why this keeps going. All right. It's still difficult for you to be ap able to see. So I turn it sideways because I've done this enough times, and I don't know why it uh, fast forwarded through where people, I see people doing this. So I'm like, let me just put one on the side so that you can, that you can see. You don't have to hurt your neck. It's difficult for you to see that those features are upside down, even when you know those features are upside down. Because the way in which your brain is processing faces holistically, you're seeing the whole face, and these kind of features upside down are inconsistent, essentially, with your uh, experiences with human faces. So we're going to talk about this very briefly when it comes to sketches and composites, when a witness is asked to sit down for an hour and a half, two hours, and find the nose or create the eyes, right? and how this is a very difficult process. So for a very long time, uh, late 1970s, researchers in the field have talked about why witnesses make mistakes under two broad categories. The first we call estimator variables, and there's nothing that anyone can really do about these estimator variables. These are all the factors that are related to the perception, the event, the encoding. So again, if it's that robbery at night with the mask and the witness is intoxicated, all of those things are going to influence reliability and accuracy, but they are what they are. There's nothing that anyone can do. The system variables, though, are those procedures, those choices that law enforcement and investigators make when they are collecting evidence and when they're asking witness questions. And this, I should also say, goes to uh, attorneys, prosecutors and defense attorneys, who also are asking witnesses questions. Um, all of these principles apply uh, to them as well. So estimator variables, um, here's a non-exhaustive list. I'm not going to spend um, 
really much more time than this talking about estimator variables because uh, the point really is to talk about what can you do to reduce eyewitness identification errors. But these are important to evaluate, again, the likelihood, the chances that the eyewitness could make an accurate identification given the circumstances surround, surrounding the strength of their memory. Short exposure, high levels of stress and arousal, decrease um, reliability, distance, lighting, long periods of delay, many things that um, are probably uh, common sense to you. The presence of a weapon is interesting in that it also tends to decrease the reliability of the identification. This is related to, especially in short crimes or short events, the eyewitness looks at the weapon, right? They look at the gun, they look at the knife, and when they're looking at that object, they're not looking at the face. So when they're not looking at the face, again, they just have less time to be able to encode or have a strong memory of the uh, perpetrator's face. If there's multiple perpetrator crime, it's a very, very similar finding. And that if you have three faces or five faces to pay attention to, then of course you're going to have less time to look at or encode those individual faces. We are less accurate at identifying people from racial and ethnic groups different than our own. It's nothing to do with racism, um, but we are less accurate at those, uh, those identifications. So I just want to show you uh, very quickly um, the factor of attention and how attention can also influence uh, reliability. Um, if you've seen this video before, I'll just ask kindly that you um, not say anything. Um, there's, uh, once I give the instructions, I'm, um, you'll, uh, you know, hopefully everything will be clear, um, but there uh, may be a small prize uh, for the first person who raises their hand and gets the answer right. So here's what you need to do. Um, there are six people here, three in white shirts, three in black shirts, and your job is to focus on the team in the white shirts, and they're going to be passing a basketball. So all you need to do is count the number of passes. Uh, make it a little bit more difficult. Um, you, can only, you should only count hand-to-hand -hand passes, so no bounce passes. All right? So if the individual takes the ball, bounces it off the floor, the other person catches it, that doesn't count. So the first person with the correct answer raises their hand as soon as the video is finished. Um, let me get a small prize. All right. Are there any questions? No? All right. Congratulations. The answer is 12. But there's no prize. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I just, well, I did say may. I said try to say it really quietly. There may be a prize. Uh, um, so don't, don't be upset. What I needed to do is I needed to increase your motivation. Um, I. <laughs> I gave a talk in front of the District Attorneys Association in Pennsylvania once, and a, uh, a colleague who had organized the conference promised like really big professional um, hockey tickets uh, to the first, and I'm, anyway, so I didn't want to, I wanted to leave it as ambiguous as possible. So yes, uh, the answer is 12. I did hear some people giggling though while it was going on. Why, why were you giggling? Yes? Because of the... The gorilla suit guy. Okay. So, um, like the penny example, there are people going, the what? I'm sorry. Uh, so you and I, I can consult with you later. On the, no, I'm just kidding. You're not the only person who saw the, uh, the gorilla suit guy. But there are people in here who really have no idea what it is that you're talking about. So I'm going to play this again. Um, this is not a trick. Those of you um, who know this uh, video know that I'm playing the exact same video. I've been accused of switching out videos um, in the past. Can, if you can do me a favor and just tell me when you think you see him. <laughs> yeah, and you actually, to get it right, you actually, the basketball goes around the gorilla. 
So to get 12, you, you actually had to watch the basketball go around the gorilla. So the question is, what happened, right? And uh, congratulations on the 12. I'm not going to put you on the spot exactly, but if you got 12 or somewhere very close, um, there's a very good chance that you didn't see the gorilla. So what happened? You were so focused, right, on the white movement that you essentially ignore black movement, right, because that's not helping you with this particular task. So the guy in the gorilla suit and the black suit kind of walks through, ignore, ignore, right? You can't pay attention to that. So even though your eyes probably fell upon him, right, as you were he was going by, you do not actually have the opportunity to see the gorilla. So this can maybe partly explain why it is you arrive on a scene that may have been you know, a chaotic scene, and you have one witness who says, oh, there were two perpetrators, another witness who says there were five perpetrators. Like, what are you talking about? Different people who are focused on different things might actually be able to not see uh, pretty big things in their environment. Also, if they didn't perceive those additional perpetrators as being related to the crime, right, and not important, obviously, at the time, then they may not have even uh, kind of seen those individuals, if you will. So it's possible that someone can be extremely reliable and get major answers correct, but miss the gorilla. Right, so miss kind of major things. And that does not mean just because they missed major things that you should discount everything else that it is that they have to say. So the system variables essentially are those things now where law enforcement um, has control um, over uh, what it is that they do in terms of collecting the evidence. And it really, really starts the 911 or dispatcher um, call. And it's very, very important that dispatchers are trained to collect evidence without contaminating the evidence. This is also the individual who should be telling the witnesses not to speak with other witnesses waiting for law enforcement to arrive on the scene. So it's not the first responder, you know, the law enforcement who arrives and says, okay, split up. Do you know how much conversation has happened between those witnesses in the uh, maybe several minutes um, you know, prior to arriving? So the dispatcher needs to tell them not to speak with one another. In fact, the dispatcher can tell them, if possible, start writing down, you know, uh, separate them. Just about everybody has a, an iPhone or uh, some sort of um, smartphone these days. It's possible for witnesses to start getting information down quickly. And the crime scene control, co-witness contamination is extremely important to avoid. And this is essentially the, you know, we kind of want to know. We want to kind of reach out to other individuals. Certainly, even for the penny example, we had cheaters right here, you know, just, you know, help me with this little task. In something that's so important, imagine what the desire is for witnesses to share that information, but it's not helpful for the evidence. Uh, it's, it's certainly going to contaminate the evidence. The witness interviews, is anyone here trained on the cognitive interview? All right, you should really look into the cognitive interview. This is not part of uh, my presentation today. The cognitive interview is an interview technique um, that I say is very, very difficult uh, for married people because the general principle is don't interrupt. Um, in general, I mean, it's more complicated to the, than that, but the general principle is not to interrupt. And so it's essentially, the eyewitness is encouraged to just tell their story, get through their story, and then if you have follow-up questions, then you stop them at the end and ask your follow-up questions. And when the eyewitness is saying something kind of complicated, and he says, well, you know, he went over there, and you go, who, who, who was he? The, the first guy or the second guy? The, the second guy, okay, continue. Um, and so then he ran over you know, to the house. Well, which house? Um, well, the, just let the witness tell their story. Even better to record it so that you don't miss anything as you're probably madly taking notes. The great thing as well is uh, the researchers who developed the cognitive interview have uh, created a self-administered interview. It's a paper and pencil interview that the witness themselves goes through. It could be translated into however, however many languages. Uh, patrol officers could have a copy in their glove compartment, pull it out, give it to 10 witnesses at the same time so they're clearly separated um, doing the interview themselves. Um, so the self-administered interview um, and the cognitive interview. And so finally, um, the area that I've been studying for the last 15 years, um, eyewitness identification procedures. Um, so the most common identification procedures used by law enforcement are um, the show-up identification procedure, that one-on-one uh, one -on -one confrontation, 
Mugshot searches, uh, I'm not sure if you use them here in large cities, uh, they uh, tend to be used. And this is where the eyewitness sits down in front of hundreds, if not maybe thousands of photographs, searching through, hoping that the person who committed the crime had been arrested before, and as the witness is searching through these hundreds and hundreds of photos, they'll say, aha, here he is. Um, the problem is that it's essentially an all-suspect identification procedure. And any single person that the witness pulls out and says, what about this one, is now a potential suspect that you have to trace down. I was involved in a wrongful conviction in New York City um, where this is exactly what happened. The witnesses pulled out you know, the first photo. They were all together in a room pulling out the photos. They went and they ran that guy. He was incarcerated. Keep searching. Oh, this guy here, he looks pretty familiar. They run the incarcerated, keep searching. The first person that the witnesses picked out of these uh, folders, these long uh, folders, um, who was not incarcerated at the time um, was Fernando Bermudez. And he spent 18 years in prison uh, for the murder that he did not commit. Um, so it's essentially the all suspect, anybody who gets picked, um, you know, chances are their alibi is going to be like Fernando's was. I was with friends, you know, on that day. Uh, and those friend alibis, even though they did testify at his trial, um, were not believed by um, the jury. So mugshot searches can be extremely pro problematic just because the error rate is so high um, in the false positives. We'll talk very briefly about sketches and then finally lineups and photo arrays. Um, so composites or sketches um, these days are more likely to be those computer kit programs. Uh, Faces 4.0 is a very common one. Um, eFit is another, um, another variation essentially on that. But the problem with composites and sketches is that they, um, it, it's a very, very difficult process to do. Um, and one of the reasons, as we go back to Julia Roberts, is this is not how our brain is wired to essentially process faces. It's not Mr. Potato Head, right? This is not how we do it. Where we take the outside and then let's add a nose and let's add some eyes and how about that mustache or maybe these lips. It's, it's not essentially how we, how we do it. Um, so I just want to show you a couple of examples and just get your opinion. Um, what, what do you think of that? Do you think that's good composite? Do you think that's him? So here's the one caveat that I'll say about composites and sketches and how they can be extremely useful. Um, not all criminals are smart. Oh, that's groundbreaking, right, information for you. Um, what happened in this particular case is this guy turned himself in when this composite was printed in the paper. And when he turned himself in, law enforcement were very surprised, like, why are you here? <laughs> and his response literally was, but didn't you see the picture? I mean, it was only a matter of time before you found me. So maybe composites and sketches can be very useful if there's you know, guilty people walking around thinking, uh-oh, there's a witness who clearly saw me that looks exactly like me. Right? The guilty conscience, essentially, it might be uh, particularly useful. I think a haircut, maybe a shave, probably, uh, probably would have been just fine. Um, but this is another example that is, um, I think, a little bit more disturbing. Um, so what I want you to do is just, you know, just visually scan um, these sketches, um, compare the sketches as I'm telling you the, the story of how um, these came about. Um, these are from uh, a case, uh, in actually nine different cases in California, um, where these are sexual assault cases. So these are all from uh, rape victims. And um, it was a big practice in this police department to do sketches and composites. In fact, there were a few other victims um, who said that they just didn't get a good enough look in order to be able to do the sketch. So these are victims who had a good enough look to be able to do a sketch. Um, fast forward uh, a number of years, so you can see that these are mostly 2000, 2002, um, and DNA testing was done on all of these rape kits. And guess what? the same guy. It was the same guy in the other uh, cases, in the other um, assault cases as well, but the witnesses um, didn't have good enough memory in order to be able to do a composite sketch. So, let's see, he wore a hat or covered his hair in some way each and every time, but as you can see there are 
if you look at the dates, teardrop tattoos that are on and off, one side or the other, change in number, just as one example. But the individual looks to be of different racial and ethnic backgrounds from, you know, if you were to pick, you know, kind of two uh, sketches. And so the, the real question here is, and look at the age, I mean, the top to the right, I mean, the age looks 20 years different. And so the question is, which one of these witnesses was actually a really good witness? In the sense that they created a composite sketch that looks exactly like the guy. And what are the characteristics of that person that you can use to say, ah, the witness has these characteristics, therefore the likelihood of them creating a great composite sketch that could be very useful, right? I've checked all the boxes. There are no boxes. There's nothing that we have that says, oh, these are the characteristics of the witness, therefore they're going to be likely to produce a composite sketch that looks great. There's nothing of the sort. I don't have the actual photo of the real perpetrator, so I don't know which one of these, if any, are even really close um, to the individual. But the point is, is that in the DNA exoneration cases and other wrongful conviction cases, the question always arises, how did the innocent person become the suspect to begin with? And unfortunately, the answer, much more frequently than you'd expect by the use of composite sketches in the country, is because someone saw the sketch and called in a tip. So the very famous case in North Carolina, uh, Jennifer Thompson, Ronald Cotton case, and this is exactly how Ronald Cotton became a suspect in the case. Jennifer Thompson did a sketch, it ended up in the, uh, the paper, probably on the news as well, and people called in. I think I know who that guy is, right? It's Ronald Cotton. Ronald Cotton's photograph ended up in a photo array and she picked him. And then she picked him again in a live identification procedure. So the question has to remain, if the eyewitness creates one of these and then has this, sometimes witnesses are given a copy to take home with them. The issue about contamination of the witness's memory is, is their memory of the perpetrator what he actually looked like? Or is it now closer to what the sketch is that they created? So it's not really a surprise if someone sees a sketch, right, says, oh, I, I think I know who that is, and then the witness picks a person who happens to look very similar to the sketch. Right? We shouldn't be surprised um, that that ultimately happens. So composite sketches are um, uh, highly unreliable. The other uh, problematic thing, which you won't like at all, is that research shows that if you ask a witness to sit down and do a composite sketch, and then you get the bad guy, and you show the witness a photo array with the bad guy in it, the witness is less likely to pick the bad guy. Their memory has been affected or uh, altered to the point where they are less likely to make the correct identification. All right, on to lineups and photo arrays, and I use the terms interchangeably. Does anyone here use live identification procedures? So photo arrays, right, are the Photo arrays are what I'm assuming um, most common um, uh, photo arrays that individuals use. So I use the term lineup and photo array um, interchangeably. Um, essentially, it's you know the in live individuals versus photo arrays. And live presentations actually um, add a whole host of problems that photo arrays uh, don't necessarily give you. So the purpose of a lineup, it's very, very important to remember the purpose because we are testing the witness's memory. It's a memory test. This essentially gives you more information after the test than you had before. And what's key, absolutely critical, is that you recognize that it is not a reasoning task. Like the pennies, right? if it takes you a couple of minutes and you find you're comparing or you hear the witness making those comparisons out loud, well, I don't know, it's between three and five. Well, tell me a little bit more about that. Well, the hair on number three and the nose on number five. Well, you know, hair can change, right? So, oh, I guess it must be number five then, right? The witness who verbalizes these kinds of decisions, and we know witnesses in real cases do verbalize these kinds of decisions, are telling you that they didn't recognize the person. So they're making an, a choice from the identification procedure, not based on recognition, but because they kind of figured it out or narrowed down to who the suspect actually was in the case. 
So it should not be evidence, it should not be testimony based on can I figure out which one here is the correct answer. So we really talk about the traditional identification procedure, the six-pack or the simultaneous identification procedure, like a multiple choice question. Right? And at the top of my multiple choice exams that I have for my students, I actually say, pick the best answer relative to the other. So I'm encouraging guessing right on that exam, right? I don't want anyone to leave anything blank, but that is not similar to the eyewitness identification task. So essentially they have the six alternatives in front of them and many individuals who don't kind of immediately recognize the person will engage in this relative judgment and just pick the one essentially that's the best. The problem with relative judgments though is that someone in the procedure is always going to be the best just like the pennies, five and seven. Those were the two best ones. And then the question for that witness is, is it good enough? Is it close enough for me to say, yes, I think that's the person? So I'm gonna show you what this looks like essentially from a real um, case. Um, this is a homicide um, investigation. And this is the photo array that was shown to the uh, witness in the case. And we're just gonna assume for argument's sake here that number three, is the actual perpetrator. So he would be the correct answer. Um, so what researchers did is they um, got a copy of the video surveillance that essentially showed the entire crime. And they showed the video surveillance to a group of uh, individuals, group of participants. See the video and then they see this array and then they're essentially asked, which one do you think it is? But he may not be here. So 21%, not sure if you can see that, 21% of people actually said, I don't think he's there at all. But a good number of people, 54%, I'm going to say got it right and picked pick the actual person. That's not the interesting part. That's not how we test relative judgment. How we test relative judgment is we say, okay, let's take a second group of people. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take out the correct answer. So they're only left essentially with wrong answers, with my fillers. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to see where those responses go. So are the 54% of people, when the correct answer is not there, are they going to go down to 21% and now we're going to have 75% of people say not here? Or if relative judgment has any merit, what do you think will happen to those choices? They're going to spread. In particular, is there anyone who's a likely target of the next most choices? Number four. Statistically, number four, because 13% of people picked him when the right answer was there. He even got picked 13% of the time. So what happens? Now, 38% of people pick number four because he's the next best option. What's also interesting is that only 11% of people chose the you know, not here kind of option. People wanted to choose, right? They feel really kind of compelled to pick from these identification procedures. So the next best option is going to get uh, chosen more frequently. So that's what the relative judgment essentially looks like uh, from the lineups. So I have this little game that I like to play. I think it's marketable. I think we could uh, you know, make, some, make some money. So if you have any of these great um, lineups, I really hope you don't, but uh, please send them to me. Um, quick, who's the suspect? Excellent, number five. Were, were you a witness to the crime? <laughs> See, here's the thing. This is a case out of New York, and the judge found that this was not unnecessarily suggestive. Which is funny, because I've shown this array to, I don't know, 7,000 people, and every single person picks number five. People who have no memory of the event. It's like having a, you know, an exam question in which the student um, didn't come to class, didn't buy the book, right? didn't go to study group, and now they get 100% on the exam. That shouldn't happen. You should have to have some memory in order to be able to get the recognition test correct. And so what do you do? If you're about to run a photo array, take it to someone who doesn't know who the suspect is in the case, doesn't know the case, and say, plop it down and say, can you tell me uh, who the suspect is? Can you pick him out? Right. Take it to a few people. If no one picks him out, or if he gets picked about the same time by everyone, then you're good. If you show it to 10 people, and people pick out your suspect, you gotta go back and start again. It's too easy a test. It's too easy a memory test. In fact, it's not even a memory test because you didn't have to have a memory in order to be able to get the answer right. 
and that's not what we should be testing. So researchers in the early 1980s said, how can we make it just more difficult for witnesses to make choices from identification procedures just based on who's the best one or which one stands out to me? So we want to reduce people's reliance on this relative judgment. How can we do it? Let's show them one at a time. That's how the sequential identification procedure essentially came about. We're trying to make choices that witnesses make based on recognition rather than can I figure out who the suspect is or does someone stand out to me for some reason. And that is the basis essentially for sequential presentation. What happens is that the witnesses see the, the, the people or the pictures one at a time. They make a decision, yes or no, or not sure, as each picture is being shown before they move on to the next one. And at the end of the day, if the witness, at the end of the whole procedure, says, can I go back and see number three again? The, the principle that's recommended is, absolutely. Let the witness go back and see the entire procedure again. But you still have to ask yourself, why didn't the witness say yes to number three the first time? If they really recognized number three as being the perpetrator of the crime, they should have said so when they saw number three. When they're going through the whole procedure, they say no to everyone and they come back and they say, can I go back and see number three again? Or can I see these two? Or can I look at that again? They are much more likely now to be relying on relative judgment. Now that they've seen all the options, they kind of earmarked, if you will, number three as the best one. And now that they've gone through the whole thing, now they want to go back and look at number three because that was the best one that they saw. But beating a dead horse, it's not recognition, right? So the decision is based on something else. The other thing that's recommended um, for identification procedures is what's called double blind or blind administration. Those two terms mean the exact same thing. Um, and essentially, double blind um, or blind administration is not just an eyewitness identification issue. Um, blind administration has been used um, for many, many decades. Um, the FHA requires, uh, excuse me, the FDA requires uh, blind administration in clinical drug trials. Right? So if your uh, doctor is involved in a clinical drug trial, he or she will not know if you are in the uh, clinical condition, right, the new experimental drug condition, or the control condition. And it's not because we don't trust doctors right, that we recommend this. It's because that humans tend to see what they want to see. And if a, if a patient in a clinical trial says something pretty ambiguous, like, you know, you know I'm feeling OK. If the doctor knows that that person is in the new experimental drug condition, it's possible they might interpret that. They might perceive that as being, oh, witness feeling good, right? Mm, improvement from last time. I'm seeing here in these notes, you weren't feeling so good last time. But if they don't know which condition that the person is in, they just have to write everything down verbatim. And other people will essentially figure out and translate what that means. I can't tell you the number of times I've seen cases, either audio recorded or witness rights in their own words. Um, I'm pretty sure that's the guy. Then the witness is immediately asked to circle and sign and date that photograph. Well, the witness said that they were pretty sure that was the guy. They didn't say that's the guy. And now they're being asked to engage in behaviors that essentially are consistent with witnesses who say that's the guy. So it's very, very important, individuals who know nothing about the, the investigation, know nothing about the case, um, are recommended to do just the identification procedure so that those kinds of ambiguous uh, statements can't be misinterpreted. Um, it also protects law enforcement from allegations from the defense that you, you know, put your thumb on number three as you were handing it over and hesitated a little you know, as you were pulling it away. And with sequential identification procedures, it's even worse to not have blind administration. And that's because you're physically holding the photos. So is it this guy? No. Is it this guy? No. You know your suspect's in position three. Is it this guy? The change, you can't help it, right? You know it's coming up. It's not intentional. You might not even be aware of the fact that your body language changed, that you 
sighed a little as they said no and passed him, right? You may not even be aware of these things. And research would suggest that you won't be aware of these um, unconscious uh, cues with the witness. So you're protecting yourself from all those allegations from the defense that says that you essentially engaged in activity to unconsciously or otherwise get the witness to ultimately pick uh, the suspect. So uh, I was involved in a national field study that essentially compared these two identification procedures. And again, the point of this sequential one at a time is just to make it more difficult for witnesses to just pick the best one and instead rely on their memory as a basis for their identification decision. Um, so in this study that we uh, finished in uh, 2011 uh, with Gary Wells and Nancy Stably, who are my um, co-authors, comparing the simultaneous and sequential with real witnesses in real ongoing criminal investigations, um, as was stated earlier, in four states. So what we did is we used double-blind administration and everything was done on laptop computers. So laptops were given to the uh, law enforcement agencies, they were trained on a software program, and the computer randomly decided what kind of identification procedure that witness was going to get. So if they were going to get them one at a time or um, all at the same time. Um, the other thing that was great is that there was a computer uh, kind of voiceover with the instructions, kind of reading the pre-lineup warnings and instructions to witnesses as well. We also audio recorded all of these identification decisions and that's how we know that witnesses spontaneously start engaging in this discussion when they're struggling with their identification decision. That they do say things like, wow, this is really hard, I don't know, it's this. Um, and so we, we have um, all of those transcribed uh, now. So sadly, after five years of data collection, um, we had just shy of 500 identification procedures. And these are stranger identifications. Um, some jurisdictions actually will do a photo array of your ex-spouse just to cross the T, dot the I, right? They'll put the photo array together of people that you clearly know very, very well, um, just to add that to the, to the case file. So we didn't want to include those uh, clearly in this, in this uh, study. Um, so here's an example of what uh, witnesses who were randomly assigned to get the simultaneous procedure, this is what the screen would look like once they got to the, the lineup. And the question was, um, law enforcement uh, chose the question, do any of these individuals look familiar to you? And then the witness could say yes, no, not sure. Then they would essentially, um, if they clicked yes, they were asked to confirm that response because the witness was doing everything on the laptop computer. We wanted to make sure they didn't make a mistake and hit the wrong button. Um, so they would confirm all their decisions. And then they were asked which one looks familiar and then how does that person look familiar to you? It didn't happen very often, but every once in a while it's, oh, number four is my uh, cousin. Uh, I don't know anybody else here, but, but I know her. And that was important for investigators. They wanted to know those kinds of uh, identification um, decisions. In the sequential, identifica uh, uh, sequential identification procedure, the question is, does this person look familiar to you? They would confirm that, um, the yes, no, not sure. And then, how is this person familiar to you? For reasons related to the crime or unrelated to the crime. Um, so they would do this um, for all the identification procedures. The results, um, just direct your attention through the, uh, the arrows right now. Um, so identification of suspects was uh, essentially the same, regardless of the identification procedure used. So green is the sequential identification procedure. So it looks slightly higher, but it, there's no statistically significant difference. Um, so on average, about 26% of the arrays resulted in a positive identification of the suspect. What we, where we did find um, a significant difference, though, was in the identification of the fillers. So not the suspect, but the known innocent people. And filler identifications, uh, as you know, are not good for the investigation. When the eyewitness says, absolutely, I recognize that person, and you know for certain that that person could not have committed the crime, it tells you, obviously, some about the eyewitness's memory. But it also could be the case that that person happens to look very similar to the real perpetrator. Now, through investigative leads, maybe a couple of weeks later, you have a new suspect. It's virtually impossible now to show the new identification procedure with the new suspect to that witness who made a positive identification of an innocent person. It would be a defense attorney's dream, right? You know, how many you know, different people is this witness going to positively identify? So clearly, a goal to reduce filler identifications is a very, very important goal for both victim witnesses and for the investigation. 
But what's kind of interesting and I, I think shocking at the, at the same time, I think it was very surprising really for us, is that when we looked at all of those witnesses who said, yes, I recognize that person for reasons related to the crime, so all the positive identifications, and when we break them down into how many of those people were suspects and how many people were fillers, innocent people, from the traditional procedure, and let's keep in mind, these are double blind, all the best instructions that we could be developed, right? So not like the penny where I tried to goad you into, you know, picking the wrong answer. They're given everything, the best instructions possible. Still 42% of witnesses made an error. So the false positive rate of 42%. I've asked judges, could you imagine if the prosecution came to you and said, hey, I've got this new form of evidence. He says, okay, well tell me a little bit about the error rate. Well, the false positive is 42%. What do you think? We're gonna, can I uh, get my expert in? And we'll, uh, <laughs> um, there's no way I think that a judge would say, sure, bring it on in, right? The, it, it's, I think, a little bit scary. But even when we use the best, the most recommended procedure, 31% of all eyewitness identifications in these real cases were wrong. So a false positive of 31. So when I said to you earlier, if you had to go, if your phone rang, or you know, some other thing, that we can reduce identification errors, we can. About 11% of positive identifications can be reduced, just by showing them one at a time versus all at the same time. But we don't get rid of all of the mistakes. Why is that? These haven't dealt with any of the estimator variables. Witnesses still, witnesses who say, yeah, I think I could ID the guy. Right? You ask the witnesses, right? Do you think if you saw him again, you'd be able to pick him, right? Yeah, I think I could. It turns out that judgment of whether or not they could or not is clearly not a perfect indicator of whether or not they actually do well on the task. So witnesses who have poor memories or weak memories still view the procedure and ultimately make um, mistakes. And currently, there's nothing else we can do procedurally to reduce these errors anymore. We don't have any other kind of techniques and tools. So again, it's important for law enforcement to make some evaluation of what is the likelihood that this witness can get it right, even if ultimately you know, I use the most uh, or best practices, the most recommended uh, procedures. So the other, I've um, heard discussion about the blind or the alternatives to double blind administration. Um, and there are great models around the country for small departments, of course the vast majority of police departments around the country are small police departments. So if you don't have or can't find someone who is not aware of who the suspect is, it's a small department everyone knows essentially or is involved in all the cases, how can you go about kind of running that procedure? And what's recommended is what we call the folder shuffle method. And you literally print out the individual images for the sequential identification procedure, get a folder, manila folder, tape it in so it doesn't fall out, and literally shuffle them up. Right? So shuffle them up. At the end of the day, that person, the detective who's doing the identification procedure, won't know where the suspect is in the order. So you hand the folder over to the witness one at a time. Right? Take a look at this one. I'm not, you know, make sure you can't see essentially the, the image. They close the folder, yes, no, not sure, and you move on to the next. And in that sense, the detective who knows who the suspect is, is blinded at that moment when the witness ultimately is looking at that face, is looking at that person. And so that's the recommended technique um, to use um, if you uh, are unable to find a separate individual. Um, what I want to do is show you just very quickly um, a video um, that comes from a show that uh, Brian Williams, a newer show, um, called Rock Center. I guess it's about a year old, um, uh, this particular video. And this comes from the Dallas Police Department, who switched um, some time ago to doing double-blind sequential identification procedures. They also videotape their identification procedures, and that's essentially what you're going to see here, the eyewitness who is making an identification decision from, from that procedure. The other thing that they will uh, talk about, it's a one-minute video, literally, um, but the other thing they're going to talk about is something that's very important for double-blind administration, and that's telling the witness that the person doing the procedure doesn't know who the suspect is. Right? It's important that the witness be informed explicitly that the person doesn't know the correct answer. 
And the reason for that, imagine it really is a blind administrator and they don't have any involvement in the case and they're going through the sequential photos, you know, is it this one? No. And then they start sneezing, you know, uh, allergy time. The witness goes, oh, maybe that's a sign, right? They're trying to, right, let me pay more attention. If the witness knows that this individual has nothing to do with it, then clearly they're not going to be looking for these cues. Um, so. Oh, the cues. Once we figured out uh, what the science was telling us, we, we, we built our practice around the science. This is the new way lineups are done by the Dallas PD. The two departments in the country to videotape the process. This woman is trying to pick out a suspect in a homicide case. I'm and I'm Lineups are now administered by an officer who knows nothing about the case and doesn't know which photo is the suspect. Also new, the officer explains the suspect may not be in the lineup at all and that the investigation will proceed whether or not there's an ID. And as you can see, the photos are now shown that's what recognition looks like, right? Um, so, you know, every once in a while, and I give you know talks. I know that um, you know prosecutors are sometimes concerned about. You know, well, the identification, will it, you know, be as valuable, will it be as impactful, essentially, for the jury? Um, you know, I, I think it really is. And at the end of the day, in the simultaneous, or the, the six-pack, you kind of lose that immediate reaction because you don't know where the witness, essentially, is looking, right, at any particular time. So the suspect's in position six, and the witness is kind of, you know, going around, you know, and looking, and then all of a sudden there's the delayed reaction. Um, it's much less impactful. Um, and so, so that's essentially the procedure that's being used. And I think the video, it would be very difficult for the detective to talk and explain what the reaction was. Well, she was really excited or was really, you know, I mean, to see it essentially and in her own words, I think is very uh, important as well. Um, so I want to talk about some just very uh, quick uh, things that are also very important in terms of evidence collection and, and preservation, and that has to do with witness confidence and certainty. Um, jurors rely heavily, uh, as do judges, on witness statements of confidence. I'm absolutely certain, I'll never forget that face, um, you know, et cetera, these kinds of statements that witnesses often make. The problem is research shows that confidence is not uh, the perfect predictor of accuracy. So just because a witness is absolutely confident doesn't necessarily mean that they are accurate. So we ask, uh, well, why is that the case? And it's because when you think about what is confidence, right? Confidence in anything that you've, any decision that you've made. Right? Maybe you skipped breakfast this morning because you were running a little late and now you're sitting here thinking, oh my goodness, when is that uh, lunch, you know, going to come? Right? At the time, it seemed like a perfectly fine decision, and you were confident in that decision, and now you're starting to kind of look back on it and regret it. So many things can change our kind of feeling or belief about a decision that we've made. And this is why confidence is not a great predictor of accuracy. So many things happen to the witness after the identification to all the way up to the point where they're swearing under oath and testifying. They're going to be told, probably, that the person that they identified is the actual, you know, was the suspect in the case and that's going to trial. The witness is going to sit with the prosecutor and go over the questions that they're going to be asked. They may even be brought to the courtroom if they're very nervous to kind of see the layout and where they're going to be um, sitting and, and all of these things. All of those things can influence witness confidence. And they clearly have nothing to do with the decision that the witness made at some time in the past. Um, so researchers have been studying for about 15 years what we call the kind of post-identification feedback. So after the witness makes their identification, what you say to the witness can have a tremendous impact on that witness's uh, confidence and ultimately how they're viewed in terms of reliability. So in a typical study, um, what will happen is a witness uh, or participant will see an event, we'll get them to make an identification uh, from a lineup, and then we manipulate feedback. So we either say, good, you identified the suspect, or thank you so much, you've been really helpful. Right? 
So just saying anything positive, really, to the witness afterwards. In the control condition, we don't say anything. So we don't give them any information. Then we say, oh, I um, forgot to ask you some questions. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to ask you about the event. So can you tell me, I know, did you get a good view of the person? Um, were you paying attention? And tell me about the lineup identification. Was it quick? Was it an easy decision? You knew immediately, right, that the person you picked um, was, the, was the perpetrator. Um, so what I'm going to um, show you here in this uh, uh, chart, um, first I'm going to show you the control condition and then the confirming feedback. And we're asking witnesses how certain they are in their identification decision. Did they get a good view? How clear is the face, the witness's face and the memory? Was it easy for them to make the identification decision? And on what basis are they making the ID? Is it from their memory, essentially? So people in the control condition look like this. In this particular study, um, they had a terrible view. Only 2% of people said they had a great view, right? Um, you know, and that the face is very clear. Witnesses who are told, good job, thank you so much, you've been very helpful, look like this. 50% are absolutely certain in their identification. And let's be clear, the only difference between these two groups is essentially the little pat on the back, good job, you got them. So what this also kind of speaks to is, well then how is the prosecutor or the judge or the jury to evaluate whether or not, you know, view is important? All of these people, by the time they testify at trial, have been given so much feedback and information about their decision that they've made, just about all of the people who testify are going to be inflated on these issues. And what that means is that law enforcement has to do the interview. They have to, you have to ask these questions. Did you get a good view? Let's find out exactly what happened before the photo array is shown. After the photo array is shown, after the eyewitness makes the decision, guess what? They all look like this. And you may falsely believe that the eyewitness actually had a much better view or opportunity to see than they actually did. The eyewitness isn't lying. They really believe, oh, I got it right, Whew, right? Did I pick him? Did I get him? If you've ever had a witness after they made an identification say, was that, was that him, right? Wow, that should really, really make you step back and go, uh-oh, was that really a recognition? The witness should not be asking you if that's the person who committed the crime. So additional lineup reforms, in, in addition to getting the confidence statement from the witness immediately after the identification, that's the recommendation, because then it's actually useful. Right? So it can be very useful um, if it's if given right away. Are the pre-lineup instructions, that I'll mention very briefly, and then how you go about picking the fillers. Right? How do you pick the wrong answers, if you will, out of the multiple choice kind of exam uh, question? And so that's um, what I'll cover in my last uh, about five minutes with you. Um, so the pre-lineup instructions um, are extremely important. Research has shown that if you do not give that may or may not be there, think back to the penny, when you really thought your job was to choose, right? that the real perpetrator may or may not be there, can increase false identifications by 45%. So this is not a minor, you know, like, oops, I forgot to give him those instructions. This is very, very important in terms of reliability. Um, in Connecticut, um, State v. Ledbetter, uh, about eight years ago, came out with a decision that said the state must prove that the eyewitness was given these instructions. And if they don't, then the jury is going to get special instructions, essentially saying that the eyewitness um, testimony is less reliable as a result of not giving those instructions. So what happened across the state of Connecticut? There's a form now where the eye, all of these instructions are given, the, the eyewitness initials after each one, they sign and date before the identification procedure happens. And so now that just becomes part of the file. The prosecutor gets it. It's very easy for them now to prove that the witness got all of these great instructions. For fillers and filler bias, the thing to take into consideration is like that one I showed you where number five kind of jumps off the page. Um, the principle is that the suspect shouldn't stand out, but no one should stand out. You don't want to draw attention, the witness's attention, to someone who's totally innocent of the crime as well. So, the problem that we see, I see kind of uh, nationally with law enforcement, is that in picking fillers, your, most uh, departments are going about it the wrong way. What you do is you take a photo of the suspect, the most recent one that you have, and then you go look for five people who look similar. 
and that's not the recommended practice. The recommended practice is you take the witness's description, hopefully the suspect matches the witness's description, but that's a conversation for another day, and then you find five people who match the witness's description. That's the principle. One of the issues that I think we found in this field study, and um, maybe why the suspect ID rate was around 26%, is that some of the arrays that we viewed, I swear to you, it, it was like they had taken the photo of the same guy and put it in there twice. So they look so similar, and I was convinced. And then we looked it up, and nope, it's two guys. And I'm looking at them side by side going, there's no way these are two different people. The test shouldn't be so hard that the suspect's mother can't pick him out correctly, right, from the identification procedure. That is not the point. We want to make sure that people who have a memory, a good memory for the event, get it right, but you don't make it so difficult that essentially nobody can pass. And so using that principle of making sure that no one stands out and using the witness's description is essentially all that you need. In this case, the witness said that the perpetrator um, had a patch over his eye. And number one is the suspect. I did not Photoshop this. He is missing an eye. Um, and so the photo, you know, the witness's description is witness had a patch over his left eye. So what's the array that the, line, that the police gave? This one. Right? Now they all match the description, right? Was, there were other things, you know, it looks like a homeless person, you know, et cetera. Um, and the witness picks number one. Right. Um, let's give you another test. Who's the suspect here? This is totally a trick question to see what's the description. Ah, I didn't give it to you. Okay, so that's the trick. All right, that's my test. You need the description, right, in these cases to make sure unless someone immediately kind of jumps out to you. And here's why. The plaid shirt. And this was not a, you know, mistake that, you know, someone on purpose, right? But if you don't use the witness description, you might miss out on factors that are very, very important. And so now this is going to get tossed because the judge is going to say, are you kidding? You've got one guy in a plaid shirt. But the it just so happened that he was wearing a plaid shirt on the day he got arrested, right? And was described as wearing a plaid shirt at the time of the crime. This might be taking it too far. <laughs> I wish I could say this is made up. Uh, this is from a homicide case in Bridgeport, uh, Connecticut. Guess what the witness description was? Hispanic male wearing a mask. Um, and uh, so the detective took a black marker and drew masks on everyone in the array. Um, after 29 minutes, the witness picked the suspect number seven. Um, 29 minutes, I hope that makes you go, what? Um, he was convicted and um, his conviction was up upheld on appeal. Um, so very quickly, the, essentially the, uh, the last slide on what the recommendations are based on the science. First, it's the double blind administration. Um, one, it protects from allegations that you did anything untoward, unconsciously or otherwise, but also is much more likely that the witness's actual words that were used in the identification um, will be written down exactly <coughs> as they were by the non-blind administrator. Sequential presentation, a witness can go back and view the photos again if they request it. You, if, the, if, you, if the witness gets all the way through the, you know, the six pictures, you can't say, want to see him again? Right? Because that's suggesting right, that they missed him and that you really want them to give it another go. But if they um, ask for it, absolutely okay. Use the match to the witness's description in order to pick the fillers, not trying to find clones uh, for what the, the suspect um, essentially looks like. Give those pre-identification warnings that the investigation will still continue even if the witness doesn't pick anyone, etc. The confidence statement, and of course audio and video recording, I think is where essentially everything is going. Um, in looking at the Dallas kind of police department, I think to try to recreate verbally that witness's reaction in front of the jury would have been very difficult. Um, but ultimately, well, maybe that's used in a plea, uh, in a plea discussions as well, um, that kind of evidence. Um, so we can't eliminate eyewitness identification errors. 
up to the point where the police uh, kind of get involved in investigation, witnesses bring with them their own baggage, their own poor memories, other contamination issues. So we can't eliminate it entirely, but certainly these kind of small um, changes for the recommended policies can significantly reduce um, these identification errors. And that is all for me. Thank you.